All right, good evening, everybody. I'm just gonna do a quick sound check here and then I'm gonna get started just to make sure that my video is going. So um, I am on my backup laptop tonight because my my main one is being repaired. So I'm having, I'm crossing my fingers that we will get through this presentation without any technical difficulties. So what I wanted to do for all of you tonight is talk about a topic that I get asked about a lot. And actually, I'm doing a presentation on this topic later this year. And so I wanted to give all of you a sneak peek of what is in this presentation. A lot of this is what is covered in Language Therapy Advanced Foundations. But I will be adding some additional context to this presentation because I think it will tie it together for everyone. When I first wrote Language Therapy Advanced Foundations, I talked about executive functioning without actually talking about executive functioning. And by that, um, what I mean by that is that I, I really did a lot of work with metacognition, which of course falls under that um, umbrella of executive functioning and cognitive skills, but I didn't actually use that term. And I would say the same thing for my dissertation research. So what I wanted to do today is to tie it together for you and be a little bit more explicit about this topic specifically because we really are doing a lot of executive functioning work when we are doing language therapy, which is why I see language therapy advanced foundations and what I'm teaching you in here as something that does address executive functioning at the same time as language, really when you're, when you're teaching anything, you know, when you're working on language therapy, when a reading teacher is working on reading, a math teacher is working on math, a social studies teacher or a science teacher, all of them should be embedding the executive functioning work into their lessons. It should be something that is is really just layered into everything. So when someone is thinking about how to do an effective science lesson, a lot of those things that they would do when it comes to, th to thinking about pedagogy should embed a lot of executive functioning in there. The way that I address this with language therapy is that that's really what I do is that the way that I help you to do language therapy is something that takes executive functioning into account. And then once you get solid on this framework, what I recommend a lot of people do is then circle back to think about executive functioning in a broader sense. So I like to start with pulling it into the content and the specific area that you're addressing. And then I come back and talk about it again, because what a lot of people need to do, for example, is with language therapy, you need to get your bases covered. You need to build your professional skills and your clinical skills and build that foundation. And yes, be pulling in a lot of work on metacognition and self-talk and all of those kinds of things while you're doing it. That's what's actually going to make your language therapy effective and make sure that it is functional. Um, but then what you want to do after you're solid in your main content area, and this could apply for someone who is a reading teacher or a math teacher, for example, as well, is that once you feel really solid in your main content area, you can come back and you can enhance what you're doing by thinking about executive functioning again. And, and that's where I see that as a more advanced skill, both for teachers and clinicians and really anybody working on a multidisciplinary team. Because what a lot of people need to do is that they start off by thinking about, okay, what are my main things that I'm doing when I am working with my students? But once you get comfortable and once you start to feel better about where you are with, with your, your pullout therapy, for example, if you're an SLP, then you can start thinking about other service delivery models. And here is where thinking about executive functioning can be really powerful because if you're going to do effective executive functioning intervention, you've got to think about multi, multiple service delivery models, not just pull out. And yes, of course, we think about that with language therapy as well, but we really think about it with executive functioning. And this is a paradigm shift for a lot of people because when I present on both language and executive functioning, a lot of times people are asking me, how do I write goals? How do I do assessments? Um, can you give me a curriculum that I can do in a 20 minute lesson plan? 
are these things that I just mentioned appropriate to do some of the time and pull in somewhere? Yes, but are you going to be effective if you're focusing on those very specific tactical things alone? No, you've got to think about the big picture. So with all that being said, I do like to start off by helping people to build that foundation and start with those tactical things and then circle back once they have freed up some mental bandwidth professionally and start to think about, okay, now that you've got your pull out therapy, you know, like you really feel like you're, you're more comfortable and confident in what you're doing. Now you can start to think about how might you consult and train other people? How might you collaborate with other people on your team? If you know that you can't cover all of the things in your pullout sessions, but maybe you want to coach and train other people. Maybe you want to offer parent coaching, which is absolutely something you should be doing. Um, especially if you're in a private practice, it's a little bit harder in the schools and we have to get creative with it. But if you have access to parents and you're having conversations with, with them, that's a service de delivery model you can use as well. And um, how that might look on a multidisciplinary team is of course that you are thinking about coaching and mentoring and providing materials and, and training other people and um, you know getting into classrooms and things like that. Now, it doesn't always need to mean co-teaching, but it does mean that you are thinking of yourself as both a therapist and a consultant. So with all of that said, I will get off of my soapbox and start to talk about the topic for today, which is using syntax to support executive functioning and language processing. A lot of times with syntax, people think of it as grammar, think of it, people think of it as this kind of rote, really specific skill that isn't always very functional to work on. And sometimes it isn't functional the way people are working on it. But what I'm going to show you how to do today is to think about this differently so that you can think about how to work on syntax in a way that is supporting those executive functioning skills and those language processing skills, meaning those skills that are going to build that foundation that will help kids comprehend because if you are having breakdowns at the sentence level then that is going to impact comprehension and working on the main idea is not going to work if you don't build those language skills and same with executive functioning we're going to talk about how there are language skills that are going to support executive functioning and if you're working on some of those higher level skills but you're not supporting those language skills and the kids who need it you are going to see kids continue to struggle with language and it's also going to impact their ability to benefit from those executive functioning interventions doesn't mean that we're going to stop working on those high level skills but we do want to make sure that when we're thinking about our role as slps um, or language interventionists, depending on what your role is, then you want to think about how can I fill that missing piece? If I know that other people are supporting some of these skills in other parts of their day, how can I be that missing link where I can give students something that they are not getting anywhere else? So with that being said, I'm going to start off by defining those two things that I've been talking about. So Let's just start off with definitions of executive functioning and syntax. So obviously when we're talking about executive functioning, we're talking about the set of mental processes that allow us to self-regulate and engage in goal-directed behavior. Now I do have some separate executive functioning presentations that I can share where I go into all of the specific types of executive functioning skills and I separate them out into five areas, which I'm going to, I'm going to cover very briefly at the end. But again, we want to think about this is, this is attending, this is working memory, this is self-regulation and thinking into the future and visualizing ourselves doing steps and putting language to those steps so we can engage in self-talk and utilize cognitive strategies like lists, planners, any other thing that we use for a strategy to help us to get things done and stay on track and sense how long something will take. When we're talking about syntax, we are talking about a specific linguistic skill that would fall under language processing. So we're talking about the rules that govern the way that words and phrases are arranged to form a sentence 
to form sentences in a language. Again, this overlaps with things like grammar and morphology, but it's not exactly the same thing. Again, it's the, the study of and the use of word order and why words are the way that they are in those sentences. So I wanted to just talk about comorbidities. I did in a previous Q&A talk about this, but I wanted to touch on it again and share a visual just to go over high level what I talked about before. And really when we're thinking about comorbidities, just, you know, the, the main thing to know is that with certain diagnoses, there are a lot of them. So it actually, when we think about how does it look when we have multiple diagnoses, uh, multiple diagnoses, what we want to do is just think about, well, what if you just had the one diagnosis? What would that look like? And so then when you think about comorbidities, you have to just look at where do they overlap and where do they um, add something else that might be impacted. So last time when I talked about this, I did developmental language delay, ADHD, dyslexia, and I did not cover autism. So I'm just gonna go briefly through the characteristics that you would generally see with, these, uh, with each of these diagnoses. And then just remember if you, if you're thinking about comorbidities that happen, know that there are a lot that can happen. For example, developmental language delay and ADHD can go together. ADHD and dyslexia can go together. DLD and dyslexia can go together. And then it's, you know, the, the idea of, of autism and comorbidities, I know that a lot of people do have a diagnosis of autism and something else. Um, for example, ADHD, and so it's, there is, there are some lingering questions about do they really have both or do the things that present like ADHD or autism, is it, is it just one or the other? So that is, that is kind of a lingering question, but I know with the others, again, with developmental language delay and autism, we know that autism can affect language. So that one is a little less clear, but there are many people who do have multiple diagnoses and, and one of them is autism. So um, we are always learning more about how that happens. Just know that when you are thinking about this, you want to think about all of these profiles. So just to go through developmental language delay really quickly, typically the hallmark feature of developmental language delay is that you're going to see a global impact across those linguistic skills. So things like semantics and syntax, morphology, and the ability to put sentences together and to, um, to learn and use vocabulary. So all of those specific linguistic skills are going to be impacted. And because those linguistic skills are impacted, then we are also going to see executive dysfunction. It's very hard to engage in linguistic planning and reasoning if we are struggling at the sentence level. Now, sometimes there are going to be those, those executive functioning issues that seem like they are in addition to, such as the big picture things, stating the main idea, being able to visualize and self-regulate. Yes, those things will go with developmental language disorder as well, but really the main thing that you're going to see and that you're gonna to wanna to think about in therapy is that you wanna make sure that those language issues are addressed. We do want to also address executive functioning, but if you don't address the language issues, then the executive functioning intervention, they're, they're not gonna be able to fully benefit from it. And then we also know that reading and writing are going to be impacted, again, because of the language and the executive functioning issues, those are both going to impact uh, their ability to read words. So things like morphology and phonology, those are going to impact the individual's ability to, um, to decode. And then if you have issues decoding, then you're going to have that it's going to take more cognitive resources to decode words and you're not going to have as much mental bandwidth left over for comprehension. So that's going to affect comprehension. But if you have executive functioning issues, you can also have comprehension. Your comprehension can be impacted because of your, your executive functioning issues as well. So we, we kind of have to address it at both angles. 
Now with ADHD, the hallmark characteristic is that it, it is an executive functioning delay. So that's the primary thing where you've got to make sure that you're addressing that. If you're working with someone with ADHD, language can be impacted as well. So you may be doing some language intervention, but if you just have someone, you know, if you were to put someone side by side and compare a developmental language delay versus ADHD, and one person just has one diagnosis and the other person just has another, you're going to see that it's the language is, isn't going to be impacted as much as far as the specific linguistic skills if it's just ADHD, but it can still be impacted. Developmental language disorder um, tends to uh, have more of a significant impact on those language specific things than ADHD. But again, you know, one kid with ADHD or, you know, what is it? What do they say? Um, you know, one kid with ADHD, you know, one kid with ADHD. You've got to assess the profile, but generally speaking, it's going to lean more towards those executive functioning issues. Um, and then reading and writing again. Um, because of executive functioning issues, that's going to impact comprehension, uh, um, attention to detail might impact word decoding. So again, it's when you think about these things, the hallmark feature is going to be the, the thing that impacts the other things when we're thinking about language, executive functioning, reading and writing. So again, with both of those things, you're going to have to think about language, executive functioning and literacy. But where you focus depends on what's the hallmark characteristic. With developmental language delay, you may, may be making language your primary priority just because you know that they're going to have to address those things if they're going to, um, you know, benefit from the other things that they're getting. And then with ADHD, it might make sense to focus a little bit on language, but, but also be emphasizing more of those executive functioning skills. Now with dyslexia, Again, the primary uh, hallmark feature of dyslexia is those word decoding difficulties, but you can also see an impact on linguistic processing. Um, you can also see an impact on executive functioning. It's not the, the hallmark characteristic, but there's a chance that they will also have uh, be impacted in language and executive functioning and need some language intervention or need some executive functioning intervention. And yes, comprehension can be impacted as well due to the word decoding difficulties and the executive functioning issues as well. So with autism, um, again, we all know that their communication needs can vary wildly. So um, there can be, again, mild processing challenges or they can be significant support needs. So um, you might have somebody who is able to engage in conversation and they might, you know, following along in the classroom or with a conversation, working memory can be impacted, or you might have someone who, who does require um, AAC and things like that. And again, um, with autism, really language and executive functioning can be globally impacted as well, just like developmental language delay, but they um, obviously with autism, there are some specific characteristics that we would see with autism that we wouldn't necessarily see with DLD. Um, again, typically, and that has to do with the, the social executive functioning issues that you would see with autism, where a lot of those, those social um, reading, social situations and situational awareness is going to have to be taught directly. Um, probably will have to address it with DLD as well, but the approach is a little bit different with autism. And yes, uh, people with uh, autistic people can also present with with issues with reading because there can be comorbidities, but also the the language issues can impact their ability to read as well. So, um, yeah, the with again with all of these, we want to think about this because as we talk about syntax, how we focus on these things and where we choose to address syntax is going to be impacted by what diagnosis they have. I would say of all of these things, the one that's going to for sure need it the most is as would be if someone has a diagnosis of developmental language delay. That's the one where you really want to make sure you are addressing syntax. 
with the others, there's a very good chance that you're going to need to address it as well. Uh, but it might the, in, the intervention might not need to be as intensive as developmental language disorder. Um, and so again, when you're thinking about people who have who struggle with executive functioning and you're working on those high level skills and you're you know they're you're you're doing those wh questions and you are doing those um you know stating the main idea and in inferences and you know that they need work on that but you feel like you're not making progress that's when you want to really look into syntax because even if they don't have developmental language disorder there is a good chance that working on syntax could benefit them again if language is impacted there's a good chance you need to work on syntax it's just you know how long you focus on it and do you need to pull in those other executive functioning skills is is kind of dependent on what else they've got going on oops so the the previous slide that i was just on let me see if I can figure out how to, there we go. Okay, so again, this slide, again, this is when we're thinking about those, when I say there are global impacts on language with certain diagnoses, these are the things that I'm talking about. I'm talking about those vocabulary skills and that essential five that we talk about in Language Therapy Advanced Foundations. So I'm talking about things like phonology, morphology, orthography, semantics, and syntax. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about syntax primarily, um, but again, know that we've got phonology, which is the, the study of the sound system, which does also impact vocabulary, morphology, which includes the, uh, the linguistic units like affixes, um, and so those linguistic units that make up the grammatical structures, and those other, those, those parts of words that make up the word's meaning. Then we've got orthography, the study of how words are spelled, semantics, the study of, of features of words and meanings. And then finally, we've got syntax, which is again, the word order, um, study of how sentences are put together. So when we're thinking about, um, especially when we're, 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 we're talking about comorbidities, we want to remember that there is a bi-directional relationship between language and executive functioning, meaning that when executive functioning is impacted, language, impa language issues are likely. Um, when language is impacted, executive functioning will also be impacted. So are there some individuals who primarily need to focus on executive functioning? And maybe you focus a little bit on language, but your intervention is primarily executive functioning, especially if they have ADHD, yes, that is a possibility. But you still wanna make sure that those language issues are intact, especially if you've been doing things that are higher level and kids are not making progress. But when you have language issues, you can pretty much assume that executive functioning is going to be impacted. Now, again, if executive functioning issues are the primary features, Language therapy may be needed. However, a primary focus on executive functioning might be appropriate for some kids. But if there are global impacts on language, both executive functioning and language will continue to be an issue if the language issues aren't addressed. And you'll see why as soon as I get into some of these, some of these, this discussion on syntax. So part of the reason why syntax is so important is because when you are planning for the future, you are typically engaging in an internal dialogue and you're also visualizing. So that strategic thinking requires you to have an internal dialogue, which is difficult to engage in without adequate vocabulary to do it or using complex syntax. If you're going to say to yourself, you know, first I need to go upstairs and then I need to put things in the laundry basket and after that, I need to come downstairs and start making dinner. And you're also thinking of pictures while you're saying that. Well, if you can't use that language to self-direct yourself and you, because you don't have those vocabulary or sy syntactic skills, 
it's going to be hard to engage in that planning. Things like episodic memory and future thinking involve the use of temporal and causal conjunctions, words like before, after, because uh, we need those words to engage in linguistic processing and pairing that language with mental images. Um, and we also use a lot of these processes to utilize cognitive strategies like lists and planners. When you use a list, it's effective for you because you can, in your head, talk to yourself about what needs to be on that list, say the words in your head, and have an image of whatever that thing is that you're writing down, those items on your list, for example, whether they're actions or whether they're things you need to get, you have that imagery paired with that language and that's how you get it to the point where you know what words to physically write down on that list or that planner. So we need to have these skills in order to use a lot of the strategies that we think of as executive functioning strategies. When they don't work, it's usually because kids are not engaging in that internal process. Now, the, the million dollar question again, as I discussed before, if we, so now I know I, I talked about comorbidities just a, a minute ago about like, how do we think about all these different, um, uh, di like all the diagnostic criteria. Yes, you want to think about differential diagnosis in your therapy planning, but you also want to think about what you need as a clinician. So in order for you to get to the point where you can look at a diagnosis, look at a student who might have multiple diagnoses and develop a strategic plan that uses multiple service delivery models, you've got to build up your skills and systems in order to do that. And if you haven't done that yet, you want to do that in phases. Um, and this is for you to be able to get to the point where you can use multiple service delivery models and you can really think of yourself as a clinical leader on your team. Um, so, and, and that's in addition to your, you know, your traditional role that you think of when you're thinking about yourself as a therapist. So the way that I mentor people through this process is that they, I have them start with creating systems for language therapy. Then I, once they get comfortable there, then we're thinking about creating systems for executive functioning. And we can start by thinking about, okay, what can I do with a small group of students or one-on-one? -on -one? And then once we get comfortable there, we create that strategic plan for adding those other service delivery models like I talked about. Now, when you're in phase one, does that mean you're totally ignoring executive functioning and you know consult with your staff and other people that you're working with? No, but it's just not your main focus for you know when you have some extra time that you can work on things. Um, and, and this is just for you to give yourself some scaffolding and building your clinical skills. So this is, this is a way that we want to think about it. And that's why I focus on things like the essential five first, before I really get into those more sophisticated models of, of working on executive functioning. Okay. So what do we do when we're thinking about syntax? So what I want to give you today is, so obviously in this program, I'm giving you a complete system for, for language therapy, but one of those things that trips people up a lot is how they work on syntactic skills. And one of the most common questions that I get is what's age appropriate? Um, what, what's the developmental hierarchy I should be using for syntax? How do I write goals? Well, to be able to answer those questions effectively, we need to figure out if they're the right questions to be asking. And also we need to figure out uh, how to prioritize. And the way that I recommend doing that for syntax as we're building that language therapy system is that we want to focus on meaningful skills, not normal skills. Um, this is a great study that I have cited. It was done in the 70s by uh, Walter Lobin. And what he looked at was the developmental progression from kindergarten through 12th grade. And you may have noticed that if you Google developmental milestones chart, a lot of them stop around age six. And that's because language growth is so variable when we get into the school age years because it's really, de it's really dependent on experience and exposure. So sometimes a more appropriate question to be asking would be, 
all right, what, what are the expectations and needs that this kid has in this environment? And what are they being exposed to rather than saying what's normal? Because that's going to be highly variable. And, and that's why um, Dr. Lobin said in, in this article, drawing up a valid chart of sequence and stages is hazardous at any age. Children vary tremendously in language ability. And that's because language, linear, le language learning is not linear and not all grammatical skills equally impact comprehension and expression. So not only is it really hard to do, it's not always necessary to do in order to help kids. We want to think about what is meaningful, what's going to make the biggest impact on their ability to develop those, those higher level cognitive processes, as well as those other language skills. So that's another reason why I like to start with language therapy first, especially for somebody who feels like they need to build a system for language and executive functioning. Okay, so the question is what syntactic skills are most likely to impact other language and cognitive skills? Well, one of those things that Lobin pulled out from that study is complex sentences and subordination. And there, there's been other research on this as well, but complex sentences and subordination are really important because when we're using complex sentences, we are using a subordinate conjunction to attach two clauses together. And I will get into some examples in just a minute here. Um, a lot of this is in your, your modules, but I'll give you the overview again because I do get a lot of questions about this. So when we're using complex sentences, we're using those conjunctions and those allow us to expand what we're saying and connect our ideas. They also allow us to make our ideas more concise. So sometimes it's actually more sophisticated to say less. It's, it's better for our listener and it's better for us in our heads if we're engaging in internal dialogue. They also allow us to communicate temporal, causal, and quantitative information. This is why a lot of kids who, if they um, struggle with language and executive functioning and you ask them a why question, they don't give you an answer that you would expect from a why question. Part of that is because um, the word because is a causal conjunction. And if you don't have a solid sense of syntax and you don't know how to use the word because appropriately in a sentence, then it's going to be hard for you to create that structure and organize your thoughts to be able to answer that question. Because typically when, when someone asks us a why question, the first word in our answer is because, you know, whatever, whatever the answer is. And so we need to be able to use those conjunctions to create that structure. The structure allows us to retrieve a lot of that vocabulary and that mental imagery that we need for that planning. So um, why do kids uh, not make progress when we are working on things like inferencing, stating the main idea, restating messages, explaining steps in a task, um, recalling past experiences, um, planning for the future. So um, in their heads or when we ask them to do it on the spot or reasoning, you know, answering those problem solving questions. Why are these things so hard? Well, if you can't structure your sentences that you're using to formulate your thoughts when you're talking to someone, to answer a question about something, to write something in, a, in an essay or an extended response, to think about what you need to go do when you get home from school or whatever it is to engage in that planning. Well, that's going to be really hard for you. It's going to increase the amount of effort that you need to take to complete that task. And you are going to have those processing breakdowns. You're also going to be more likely to get distracted and lose track of what you were doing and, um, you know, be, have a difficult time recalling those past experiences and describing those past experiences in your head as you're engaging that in that internal dialogue. That's part of episodic memory. So all of those things are going to be difficult if you don't have language to put to it. Yes, you also are using visuals and you're using tactile information as well when we're thinking on the past and planning to the future, but we're, we're pairing all of those things together simultaneously. That is really what executive functioning is. And the language gives us, um, gives us the ability to do a lot of those things. It, it really ties a lot of those other things together. So 
Why don't students respond to that high level strategy instruction? Well, typically because um, when we're thinking about reading comprehension, for example, if a reader can't parse the types of complex sentences that are encountered in academic texts, no amount of comprehension strategy instruction will help. This is uh, another, another seminal article that uh, you definitely want to be aware of if you're thinking about syntax. So it impacts reading comprehension. Uh, it, it impacts other things as well. It will impact comprehension in a conversation, your ability to engage in written expression, and again, the, the internal dialogue that you need for linguistic reasoning as well. But comprehension is one where we often see it in the schools because this is something that we're assessing and measuring. So a lot of times the big red flag that we see as speech pathologists or other people who are working with students is, hey, we need to work on comprehension because they're not doing well on their reading comprehension assessments. And, and of course, that's a really important thing to be working on as well, but, but we need to know that we, we want to think about those other things too that I just mentioned um, because working on syntax can support all of those things. So how does vocabulary fit into the mix here and why is it important that we tie these things together and really think of syntax as something that's the glue that holds things together, that can support vocabulary, that really is a vocabulary skill? Well, because when we have those content words in the sentence, when we're thinking about vocabulary, we're, we're typically referring to things like adjectives, verbs, and nouns. When we have those function words, we're typically referring to those things like conjunctions, articles, and prepositions. I'm really focusing on the conjunctions today. If you take away one thing from this presentation, it's, you know, you can, you can make an impact focusing on just those conjunctions. Obviously, you, you want to, it's the, the other things that I have mentioned are important as well, but um, you can, conjunctions are one of those skills that are meaningful and really impactful because they give structure to those other things. So back to that question of what's meaningful, conjunctions are a meaningful skill to target as well as keep track of because that is, that use of conjunctions is one thing that does tend to be more of a, a linear growth pattern throughout those school age years and tends to be correlated with those other language skills. So we don't want to be too rigid about it because remember it's language growth is variable, but it is something that is relevant to track just because of how impactful it is. Now, um, there are uh, not all sentence types that we can address and not all grammatical skills are created equally, meaning that not all of them are going to have the biggest impact on comprehension. You may know this if you've interacted with somebody who, uh, where English is not their first language and you can communicate pretty well with them. They, you know, do really well. And you notice that they have some grammatical errors. It's because certain grammatical errors don't really impact the message that much and don't really impact processing as much as others. So when we're thinking about English specifically, these are four sentence types that do tend to have an impact on someone's comprehension and expression. So that would be sentences with passive voice, um, sentences with adverbial clauses and temporal and causal conjunctions, sentences with center embedded relative clauses, and then sentences with three or more clauses. So what is passive voice? Passive voice is when the agent in a sentence comes after the recipient of the action. So for example, instead of saying the dog chased the boy, we would say the dog was chased by the boy. So it's a little bit harder to process. When you are reading something and there's a lot of passive voice, you might be more likely to have comprehension breakdowns. So why is this difficult for people with, uh, this, this would be people who, with disabilities that impact language, as well as people who are learning English. Uh, this, this also can be difficult for them. So why is it difficult? Well, because people who have language processing issues and don't have a solid sense of sentence structure, over rely on word order strategy. And this is where you focus more on the main content words in the sentence and ignore the function words. So if we were to look at the example that I just gave, let me go back really quickly. If we were to look at the dog was chased by the boy, if we focused only on the content words in that sentence and we ignored the word was and by, 
we would misinterpret that message and we would not get the entire message. So I'm just assuming that the um, person or the, 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 the person doing the chasing in the sentence is the first one that I hear. Well, that's not the right message. So again, if it's more difficult to focus on these uh, function words because they're abstract. Content words tend to be things that you can easily visualize. So that's why people tend to resort to word order strategy, but it can result in comprehension breakdowns. The other thing that people tend to do with passive voice is that they use probable event strategy. So they go by what they think is going to happen or think should happen based on their prior knowledge, not what actually happened or not what was actually being told to them. So for example, if you think that the teacher should be the one teaching and someone says the teacher was taught by the student and you don't pay attention to those content or those uh, function words was and by, well, you're going to miss the message as well. And again, it's just because you're focusing on the what you think is going to happen. You're doing this typically to minimize cognitive load and to um, free up working memory capacity. But the unfortunate thing is that sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. And uh, when people realize that it sometimes works, they start to use it. But then that means that there are times when they miss the message. So that definitely happens. Um, and again, word order and probable event strategies don't work because when we're missing those function words, we're missing key information about the message. So they work inconsistently and, and that results in processing breakdowns. So the intervention needs to focus on helping kids to pay attention to those function words and know what they actually mean. Now, um, when we're thinking about executive functioning and, um, and how this will impact their, their ability to process, students with lagging executive functioning will likely struggle with passive voice because this sentence type does tax working memory because you have to pay attention to those little details. We know that probable event and word order are ineffective strategies because we're not focusing on all of the information and the message. We actually use executive functioning skills to pay attention to the words in the sentence. That's uh, like situational awareness, reading the room. You would come into a room and kind of look around to see what's going on. Well, when you are experiencing a sentence or someone says something to you in your head, you're kind of thinking to yourself, all right, what do I need to pay attention to? Or when you're reading, you're thinking like, where, where do I need to look to, to get the information that I need. And so if you're not thinking to look at the right words and pay attention to the right things, then you might miss the message. So improving the ability to use passive voice makes you, uh, helps you to develop automaticity. So processing passive voice becomes less effort and that's going to reduce cognitive load. That's going to free up working memory to engage in more effective strategies and use additional resources for comprehension and linguistic reasoning. So if we can solidify the understanding and ability to use passive voice, that is actually going to free up resources that can be used for that high level processing. Now the next one is um, adverbial clauses, sentences with adverbial clauses with temporal or causal conjunctions. So again, temporal conjunctions would be words like before, after, um, causal conjunctions would be thing word uh, conjunctions like because. So um, the the causal conjunctions are uh, typically the ones that are going to state some kind of a cause and effect relationship, and then the temporal ones are going to say when something happened. So you may notice again, kids tend to struggle with when questions and why questions. And a lot of times it's, it's because they're struggling with that temporal or causal vocabulary. So an example of a sentence that includes a temporal or causal conjunction is Amy read the book because she wanted to learn about history. We have two simple sentences. We've got um, Amy read the book 
and she wanted to learn about history. And then we can um, use subordination and turn that second one into the subordinate clause. Um, so Amy read the book is going to be your independent clause and your dependent or subordinate clause is going to be she wanted to learn about history. So you'd say Amy read the book because she wanted to learn about history. Because she wanted to learn about history is that subordinate clause that's giving additional information about why. So when we're thinking about syntax and we're thinking about you know difficulty levels and things like that, Again, the uh, coordinating conjunctions that just join clauses together tend to be easier than these subordinate conjunctions um, that, that communicate temporal or causal information. So that tends to be more difficult. So what, what are we doing? What, what are the strategies that are usually done when someone uh, is struggling with adverbial clauses? Um, so typically what they're doing is that it does have to do with just vocabulary issues, specifically vocabulary issues like not knowing conjunctions and not knowing how to use them. They also will use order of mention. So this is similar to word order strategy, but um, instead of Instead of with the example with passive voice where there was an agent and an action, one thing did something to another thing, we're just talking about the order that events happen. So if you said, I went upstairs before I brushed my teeth, maybe you switch those around in your head. Or, or actually, let's see, I went upstairs after I brushed my teeth. That would be an example where you do need to pay attention to some of that, uh, that temporal vocabulary. And then another one that is common is probable order of event strategy. So this is kind of like probable event strategy, but it's time specific versus semantic. So for example, the, the teacher was taught by the student, that's more having to do with what you think a teacher should be doing versus a student should be doing. It, it kind of has to do with semantic features, but probable order of event strategy is when you think that one event should happen before another. So again, very similar, but you're, you're again basing it on just focusing on those content words, but not necessarily focusing on those other pieces of information that are being conveyed in the sentence. So um, the next one, when we're talking about center embedded relative clauses, there is a, a relative clause, which, which includes a relative pronoun, like who, what, where, when, um, is in the middle of the sentence. And this is a working memory nightmare for people because there's that clause that just kind of interrupts the thought process. So if we said, the people who moved in recently went to the block party, the, there's one message, which is the people went to the block party. And then there's another message, the people moved in recently, that is right in the middle of, of that other one. So when the clause is embedded and it interrupts the message, you have to go from thinking about one thing to thinking about another thing to thinking about the thing you were thinking about before. Again, from a working memory standpoint, you need to hold those things in your head. And if you don't have a really solid understanding that this is a type of sentence that you might hear and you don't expect those words to be in that place, it's going to be really difficult for you to process. The way that we improve this and free up that working memory capacity is familiarity and automaticity with these sentence types. So what that does is that we get more practice and then we expect words to be where they are and we know where to look for the right information in the sentence. That is really important. So what do people tend to do when they are um, working on or when they're struggling with center embedded relative clauses? Well, they tend to rely on Subject, verb, object, word, order, strategy. That is just another specific example of word order strategy where we expect subject, verb, object because that's a simpler sentence type and we're looking for the information to be in that right order and then it just throws us off because it's not. Because this is something that was unexpected. And so, you know, you're someone's giving you a piece of information and you're trying to get oriented and figure out what's going on um, and instead of just processing what they're saying.
And then the other one is the recency effect where you just pay attention to the most recent thing you heard and maybe you forgot something that you heard previously in the sentence. Okay, so obviously I'm going to give you one more example of uh, the, the final sentence type I mentioned, which is complex sentences with three or more clauses. So an example would be, we got up early today because we had an early meeting, but we got there a few minutes late. So we've got three clauses there. We got up early today. We had an early meeting. We got there a few minutes late. And so we've got the conjunctions because and but. So again, with these, there's just a lot going on here and a lot to process. So that's why this sentence type is difficult for all of the reasons that, that the other ones are difficult. So you could kind of insert any of those things that I just mentioned as far as ineffective strategies that people tend to use. So um, when we think about syntax and executive functioning, I wanted to just pause here and reflect on those executive functioning skills. So we've got things like time perception and self-talk and future pacing and episodic memory. So time perception being your ability to sense the passage of time. Um, if you don't have vocabulary for, um, for, for the, that understanding of those temporal concepts, then you're going to have a difficult time visualizing and having that context of, of what those things mean. One of the ways that we build time perception is that we're paying attention to the time as we're doing whatever we're doing. And then we use some of these other executive functioning skills like reflecting back on past experiences. Um, so all of these things are going to impact each other, but in order for you to be able to remind yourself to check the clock or do things in a certain order, to build those time perception skills, you've got to be able to engage in that internal self-talk, which is another skill. Again, that's, that's how we engage in that reasoning for planning to um, self-evaluate and reflect on what we're doing. Future pacing or, or future planning being the ability to plan into the future where we've got to talk about what we're going to do. We've got to visualize what we're, what we're about to do. Um, we've got to use language to do that. We've got to use strategies and pair those strategies with language when we're making lists or viewing a calendar or reading something that's giving us information. So we need to have those language skills in order to do that. Episodic memory, we're re thinking back on the past. Well, if you have a difficult time with those language skills in order to be able to um, retell that past event, well, sometimes we might be asking kids to do this out loud, but, but in order to, to utilize those internal language skills, they've got to be able to, to kind of do that in their head. And that's, that's part of what they need in order to build those episodic memory skills. And then finally, that encoding is just that ability to kind of toggle between all that different sensory information from the, the tactile, the visual, and the language. Really encoding is being able to pair that language to uh, you're visualizing yourself doing certain things or visualizing what done looks like or what the steps look like. So without the ability to put language in and talk about what you're going to do in order to self-regulate and engage in that reasoning, it's going to be difficult to build all of these skills. So yes, we definitely want to work on these things, but if syntax is an issue, then it's going to continue to... Uh, executive functioning is going to continue to be an issue because it's going to impact someone's ability to do these things. So really that's why in Language Therapy Advanced Foundations, we focus on the essential five. So we've got vocabulary, um, which underneath vocabulary, we talk about phonology, morphology, orthography, semantics, and syntax. And then we layer in that metacognition because again, Good, good language therapy incorporates executive functioning. You can't say, I'm gonna focus on language first and completely ignore executive functioning and not think about, are my students engaging in self-talk and asking themselves questions and self-directing, you know, directing themselves back when they're off track. We can't ignore that. We wanna pull that into our language therapy. And then of course, we're gonna come back and solidify it later. So today we really talked about syntax. Um, Semantics is highlighted on that screen because in this presentation series, that's the next thing I'm going to talk about. Oh. So 
again, pulling this all together, these things are going to solidify those executive functioning skills. There's that reciprocal, that bi-directional relationship. And again, um, if you're also working on executive functioning skills, um, whether it's directly you're doing it in your therapy or whether you're consulting with other people who are doing it and you're maybe focusing mostly on language in your therapy and you're using a coaching model to address executive functioning, the executive functioning is also going to impact your, your language therapy as well. But again, remember that when you are thinking about how to roll out these things, we've got to think about what our students need, but we also have to think about what we need as clinicians. And so that's why I say you, you create those language therapy systems first and make that your main priority. It's not that we're ignoring the other things. It's just that you can only focus on like your, like your one knocking down that, that first domino. So that's your primary focus and you do your best in the other areas. Then when you get solid there, then your primary focus can be really learning about executive functioning and starting to do it in small group and one-on-one -on -one with the goal of then making the next phase to be create that plan for adding those other service delivery models because that's ultimately what needs to happen in order for there to be good generalization and carryover. All right. Um, all right, so I think that's my whole, my whole presentation today. So this was for me um, twofold. <laughs> so it was giving you all a sneak peek of something that I'm gonna be doing um, for you know a, another Another organization, I wanted to make sure that you all had access to it. And this was kind of a dress rehearsal for me. Um, <laughs> so um, there are some parts where I, I've gone through and I went through it really quickly for all of you because I know that you have access to some clarification on some of the terms that I've used like coordinating conjunctions and, um, you know, what you actually do with uh, as far as syntactic strategies. So uh, I'm going to wrap up really quickly here and just say that I went through this really quickly. All these things that are on the screen here, I'm going to actually pop into the chat because, um, well, so the five component framework is that that's what we teach in, that's what I teach in this program. So you don't necessarily have to watch that training because it's an overview unless you want to, but um, all these other things are freely available to people um, in their you know, available on, on my site. So um, you actually have more content than this and more in-depth content the, in, in the actual program in here. But some people tell me, you know what, sometimes I like to go back and look at the overview in addition to the, the meaty stuff. So this is here for you if you would like it, and I will share this in the comments. Um, let's see, a couple other things that I wanted to mention is that we have coming up, um, I did just recently do an interview with a Language Therapy Advanced member on Syntax. That is in your program dashboard. So um, I will actually, in the comments below, give you directions on where that is because I'm having a hard time visualizing the dashboard right now. So I will link to that in the comments below. And then also for all of the information on syntax goals, you're gonna wanna make sure to go to module four of your program. I go into more depth about what do you actually do to work on these sentence types in that section. And then I also recently got a question about goals and examples. That is going to be in your spot framework guide in uh, the, it's in the evaluations, productivity, and data collection section of your materials library. To go to your materials library, you're just going to scroll down past all of the modules, and then you'll see the materials library. Go to the section on um, data collection, productivity, and evals, and that's where you're going to find that spot framework guide. If you have the eight module version of Language Therapy Advance, it's either labeled Language Therapy Advance Course or Language Therapy Advance Extended in your dashboard. I actually go through and give you additional video trainings to walk through that spot framework guide in modules seven and eight. So people, people ask questions about goals all the time, 
But what I wanted to point out is that I don't do it until the end um, because you need this context first of what you're working on. So that's why when people are like, what about goals? What about evals? Why isn't that first? Well, if you don't have a solid understanding of how all of this fits together and what skills you are, we, we need to build and which skills are important, then the the information about goals is it's it's going to not make sense and same with the vows so you want to build the framework first and then start to piece those other things in and that's how i think about therapy strategies as well it's framework first then fit in the other things and i would say the same thing about you know people who ask me is this name brand product good for you know whatever well start with your framework and then you can use that framework to evaluate whatever commercially available tools are, are uh, you know, on the market. Like you're pulling things off of teachers, paid teachers, you're getting them from a publishing company. Well, you can figure out how to pull those things in when you have a good framework. So um, that's a good way to build your skills to be able to evaluate those materials as well. So that's just another thing to think about. All right, thank you so much for um, all of your questions. Please let me know if you have any questions about any of this and uh, and I hope you enjoyed I hope you enjoyed the presentation and let me know what other questions you have.